everybody. Welcome to our webinar today. How can you tell if your COVID-19 recovery investments drove systems change? We're excited to have you today and looking forward to digging into our content. Today, we're going to be covering three key questions. The first one is, how did foundations invest in COVID-19 emergency recovery efforts? To what extent did these investments contribute to policy and systems change? And what changes in systems and processes have endured? And also, which have not? We hope that uh, this webinar has information for you that's actionable. We know that lots of people signed up who are representing foundations, who do evaluation, who um, do community work, and who also support it. So we hope that you might find information that helps you understand um, COVID-19 recovery impacts and also how to go about evaluating it if you haven't already, and also what some evaluations have found that have looked at longer-term impacts as well as short-term impacts. First, we'll be giving a bit of introduction, then we'll talk about lessons learned from one of our studies together, and then we will also talk about what's next and have a brief Q&A at the end. You're joined by our community science team. Our focus is systems change and also community change, and we are excited to share with you um, findings from some of our work today. I'd like to um, welcome you again myself. I'm Brandi Gilbert, a senior associate at Community Science. I lead our disaster preparedness and recovery work, as well as our youth engagement practice area. And I'm joined with uh, my panelists, Sonia Moldovan, and I'll pass it to you to introduce yourself, Sonia. Thank you, Brandy. Hi, everyone. It's great to be with you all. My name is Sonia Moldovan, and I lead uh, the Hilton's Foundation Strategy Learning and Evaluation Team. And we're a team of eight learning and evaluation officers and strategy officers that support different program areas, both internationally and domestically. Great. Thank you so much, Sonia. We're honored to have you here and to learn more about your work at the foundation. So our first question we're going to jump right into is how do foundations invest in COVID-19 recovery efforts? And here we'll be um, talking about national trends based on national studies, as well as really drawing closely on our own study that we did, the community science team did, what the Hilton Foundation team where um, they asked us to look at the impacts of their grant making portfolio. And um, this study reflects on um, interviews with grantees, so over 30 grantees, as well as five program staff on how the recovery funding went. So one of the things that one of the Hilton staff members shared with us is um, one of the most important pieces about philanthropy funding and COVID-19 recovery is that it was some of the first money to hit the streets. While government was still kind of focusing on the protective actions and didn't come with the stimulus packages until a bit later, foundation was in the early phases of pushing out funding. In particular, in this study, one important thing is that um, the Hilton Foundation decided to focus on their existing portfolio of grantees. So the relationships to push out funding quickly were already um, in place and the foundation was able to draw on those to get funds out um, in weeks right after the pandemic. And we can also talk a little bit more about how grant making processes have changed if that's of interest to anyone um, toward the end. So there are really these five ways um, that the uh, philanthropy has shaped the COVID recovery efforts. Um, one in three I see is kind of coupled. So one is expanding social services. So if you're thinking about the wraparound services or the social safety net, it's really these services. And that's kind of coupled with box three over here that focuses on um, communities and individuals that were facing exacerbated issues. So inequity kind of exacerbating anything that was happening even before the pandemic, really reaching those communities and addressing unique needs. So not blanket approaches, everybody gets the same thing, but really understanding what works in different communities and focusing on that, especially in light of the pandemic. And again, the foundation in this case was in a place to do this because of those existing relationships um, in a lot of places. Um, box number two led COVID-19 education and vaccine efforts. And again, this was a place where that tailoring could happen. So for instance, here um, in the Hilton Foundation portfolio, one example is that one of the grantees who led um, vaccination efforts, they were first slated to be kind of like big picture vaccination, public events, and then they started to deal with some people in the community who did um, did not want to get vaccinated publicly, and they um, there was some judgment associated with getting that vaccination. So they were quickly able to pivot 
and give vaccination in more of a private setting, also help to provide transportation and um, get vaccination out in that way. So it also speaks to being able to quickly pivot and meet the needs of um, communities when things were changing so quickly, especially when we were deep in the pandemic. Um, also to build the capacity of um, community-based organizations. So a number of the organizations we talked to discussed how um, having these funds just helped to kind of reduce the stress a little bit, really focusing on the work and also the how of how they were delivering services and doing that work and thinking about what was their role? How would they sustain themselves? How had their role changed or not changed in light of the pandemic? And lastly, driving systems and policy change, which that piece we're going to um, dig more deeply into next. So yeah, I want to pause and ask you if you have anything to add here. And also if you might share with our audience for the Hilton Foundation, what made you decide to evaluate your COVID-19 grant making funds? And also what were you hoping to learn most? Thank you, Brandy. Um, so there is a couple of things that um, really led us to um, start this evaluation first we knew that there was a need in the communities. We heard from our partners that there was a need. And so we wanted to uh, be supportive. And that's why we invested over 46 million in about two years um, to support our grantees, address the needs that they thought were most important. And we wanted to learn about what were some of the unintended outcomes as a result. How did this funding, which was unrestricted. So we really let our grantees decide how to use this funding. And this differs from how we usually do our work. So most of our portfolio, about 250 million of our portfolio, um, has very clear strategies. As I mentioned, both international strategies, for example, working with refugees and also um, working on uh, early childhood development. And in the US, we work with foster youth and support individuals who've uh, experienced homelessness. Um, so the reason we wanted to uh, evaluate our COVID portfolio was to really learn more about how the unrestricted uh, funding has supported the communities, supported our grantees pivot, and pick some of those lessons and figure out how we maybe embed them into our other work. Um, and also get a deeper understanding around our, um, and I forgot to also mention, we also have a partnership portfolio that works more at the systems level with bigger multilaterals and bigger donors. And we are, also wanted to see where some of those grants used to influence them to be more responsive to the pandemic. So there's both kind of a systems level learning that we wanted to have, but also a learning about what was happening with our grantees to understand how we could better continue to support them in the future. Thank you so much for sharing and um, thank you for mentioning the unintended consequences because I would say that box four about building organizational capacity was one of those unintended consequences because so much of the funding um, really nationally was about relieving immediate needs at box one and what we were finding when we were talking to your grantees is that capacity, that ability to stop, to reflect, to think about role and also to even support um, things that might come on the, some funders might say operational supports, but you know that it doesn't only have to have that category name. It's really supporting the staffing, the technology, even the transition to virtual work. All of those things help organizations to really move in the way that they needed to. Um, that we found that that was a key piece of kind of the success of the work. So next we are going to go to our second question which is to what extent do these investments contribute to policy and systems change? So this is a question that people have really been buzzing about. And now that we're more than three years past the initial onset of the pandemic, people are wanting to know, did we make policy change? Did we make systems change? What did that look like? And so first we're gonna talk um, next about three ways that that systems and policy change kind of looked. And then we're gonna talk about of these systems and policy changes and kind of the COVID funding landscape, what things fared well and are still kind of going strong and really moving and what things are under threat and have not fared well. So first, um, I want to point out our um, Center for Disaster Philanthropy did some really interesting reports. I'm a huge fan of them. And they looked at grant making um, nationally and internationally. And um, kind of what are the what were the focus areas of that? What did we learn from that grant making? And their report showed that that slide, that visual that I showed you, really um, a lot of the similar categories as our, our work. 
one thing that they also raise is from kind of a bigger, uh, large picture perspective is that internationally and nationally, actually relatively few dollars went to, um, were kind of like tagged as that policy and systems change work. So in 2020, even smaller when we were really pushing for those basic needs, and that was a rough time. So only 7% and then 2021, 17%. Of funding. So we know that um, a lot of the funding really focused on COVID-19, vaccination, information, as well as that direct service. Um, but on the flip side, there was also another national study um, that showed that of um, some interviews nationally of leaders of foundations, that policy change and system change did keep coming up as something important. It was just really this balancing of how do you focus on the immediate, more immediate needs as well as the long term. And so, yeah, I'm going to ask you a little bit about that after I share from our study, what did policy change even really look like? So um, uh, from talking with the Hilton grantees and also even just understanding the literature big picture, these are three ways that the policy and systems change really looked in light of COVID recovery. So number one, cross-sector collaboration. Number two, engagement in policy conversations and decision-making. And number three, making the emergency response system more resilient, which we all know is really important. So I'm gonna go through each of those before I ask Sonia to share a bit more again. Um, this is a quote that came from one of the grantees in our study, and it really talks about the importance of cross-sector collaboration, in particular with government partners, businesses, as well as other nonprofit partners. Um, so we talk about how grantees were really using those partnerships and how important that was to provide tailored services. So, for example, not just like to young people or to any people, but young people experiencing homelessness, young people who weren't connected to work, people in rural communities. Um, places where context matters and there are specific services need. And there are partners like those in this portfolio as well as other community-based partners that really deeply understand those needs. So um, one of your partners shared with us that they were first working with the Department of Public Health about vaccination, and they highlighted, it says here in blue, so for the Department of Public Health, it was almost a sigh of relief that we, them as a local nonprofit, reached out to them because um, now at last they had somebody to work with to try to get this done in the communities. So just thinking about, we know that our um, public sector and our government partners, we know that they're moving a lot. We know that they were also responsive, but really having the, the cross-sector partnership was critical. It can't only be done with one sector. Uh, the second is engagement and policy decisions. So we also saw that when grantees were able to do help meet those basic needs and do that on the groundwork, it also created space for them to be seen as a go-to and to step into the policy space. And I think, um, Sonia, yeah, I'm honored to have you here in Hilton is a really interesting example because within the pandemic and also more largely, the foundation has had a policy and advocacy focus, building policy coalitions, even having policy team in-house in a robust way. Um, and it comes through in this work too, in the COVID-19 recovery work that grantees, a number of grantees in this portfolio shared that either during the time that they had their COVID-19 grant making funds, which in this portfolio, in the most, ca most cases was for about a year or so after the initial onset of the pandemic, um, that these partners had opportunities to be at policy tables and to really inform what some of the funding looked like, what some of the practices look like and all of those things. And also I think that this quote is really interesting because it talks about not only during deep in the pandemic during the funding but sustaining long-lasting change so this partner says even after the funding period was over once the vaccines finally kind of hit the streets then we were looked at we were one of the first communities to get those vaccines and we knew what to do with them and we were focusing on outreach and awareness and we were helping to be and to lead at these policy tables. So I think it's really interesting to see both, um, cause there were some questions in the webinar queue about shorter term policy versus longer term. So to see like um, what that looks like and how planting a seed also shapes future policy um, presence really at these important tables. And lastly, Sonia, before I shift back to you and ask you to talk a little bit more about how you prioritize shorter term versus longer term funding, and also if you have any other thoughts on what we've been sharing, um, to build the emergency response system. So 
I was, um, so Ian and I were just talking before this that um, I was saying that I read that the World Health Organization has been recently issuing statements that we are, um, we should be on the lookout for the prevalence of future pandemics. And if people think that we are out of COVID and this is kind of it, then we should be more careful in the, our response system. So our normal kind of natural or technological disaster response systems, and also our public health and pandemic response systems. So we will, um, it's projected that there will be other pandemics in the future. So um, some of what grantee shared and also what the national literature speaks to is the ability Ability, just like in every other major disaster to become more robust, build new technologies, um, build new systems, in particular for the pandemic, build telehealth systems, which have um, changed even now the ways that many services are being operated. So I'll pause here and ask you to weigh in, Sonia. Thank you, Brandy. And I think it's important uh, for me to just uh, be very transparent and let you all know that we are not a health focused foundation. So this is not a sector that's one of our seven priority areas. However, we are very dedicated to supporting organizations that are located in the communities that we're serving, both internationally and domestically. And we recognize during the pandemic that these organizations could play a pivotal role. So uh, that's how we decided on that short-term support. We knew that those organizations would have creative ideas, would be able to implement and pivot their programs in a way that supports with this crisis that we were all facing. Um, one of my favorite stories that I heard when I went to Kenya right after the pandemic, um, one of our largest portfolios is working with the Catholic Sisters. The Catholic Sisters, as most of you may know, work in some of the most hardest to reach communities throughout the world. And in Kenya, initially there was a lot of mistrust around the vaccine. And the Catholic Sisters bonded together, created a network with a communication plan, and really started messaging with both religious communities, both the Muslim and the Christian religious communities in Kenya about the importance of the vaccine vaccine, trying to um, break some of the myths that were associated with getting vaccinated. And as a result, I believe in the region where this one sister was working, there is a 40% increase in vaccination rates uh, right after that campaign. So we recognize that this was a need. However, health is not one of our primary strategy areas. Uh, with that being said, how do we invest in longer term systems change efforts? And that's really grounded by our work um, in um, both um, trying to understand how we can support governments and stakeholders use information better for decision making and as a result, invest in sectors that have a need. So let me be more specific. So one of our longest investments since 2016, we have been investing in trying to promote a global measure for child development outcomes, particularly for zero to three, because that's where we've learned there's really a gap. And for the first time ever, both Kenya and Tanzania can now report at a population level where the children are on track, those children zero to three. So that's been an investment we're very passionate about because we know that there's typically not a lot of attention paid to zero to three all over the world. And we wanted to have the data to highlight that this is a need and what we can do about that need as a community. So that's an example of how we typically invest in systems change. We really try to understand what is the gap to really support the population that we're very passionate and we know needs that support. And then how can we work to provide that evidence or to provide support for a policy that would address that need. Um, so maybe I'll leave it there, Brandy, um, just on those examples. Yeah, thank you so much. And can you also, um, if there's anything else that you have to add about the question we received from our audience about um, how did you prioritize balancing shorter versus longer term needs, especially um, doing a lot of your funding in 2020 when the basic needs and the immediate needs were so, so grave and deep? Um, I think um, there were a couple of things. I think first, there was a recognition that there would be immediate needs because we noticed all of us in our personal lives, we noticed challenges with uh, childcare access, ch uh, education access, and all of that. So we knew that for that moment in time, there was definitely a short-term need. 
In addition to that, we know there's always going to be short-term needs. So we have a small portfolio that is just focused on disasters. And that can be something like a pandemic, that can be a hurricane. So we always have funds available set aside to address something unexpected that may happen in the US or in the broader community. And then with the long-term needs, as I mentioned before, we try to ground our strategies and we develop five-year strategies and ground them in the knowledge of our partners, our communities, and the evidence that exists, and really try to make more targeted investments to that long-term systems change. Um, so it's kind of a two-pronged approach where we recognize there's always going to be a need and we have that disasters portfolio that's completely flexible we can fund anything that comes up however during COVID in addition to that disasters portfolio we allocated 50 almost 50 million because we recognized there was a tremendous need um so that's kind of how we prioritize and have made some of those decisions yeah thank you so much for sharing I also want to again welcome everybody if you've just hopped on in the last few minutes welcome to our webinar and remind everybody that you could also drop questions in the chat as well um, we'll be we have a few more slides and then we'll be having some open discussion we have some questions that some of you all shared when you signed up in the webinar but I really do invite you to use this as your session our goal at community science is to have these sessions um, usable and um, friendly to everybody who might be signing on. So thanks again for joining us. So next on your in, in webinar family, we're going to take on our last question here, our last big picture question for a session before we turn to a bit more Q&A. So um, this is also a question that's been buzzing and I've seen different publications kind of about it. Um, what changes in systems and processes have endured and which have not fared so well? So here we're going to start with what has endured. So based on what I just shared about what the system changes have looked like in light of COVID, I would say that one of the biggest ones that has fared well is the big cross-sector collaborations and partnerships that have been worked out. And sometimes those partnerships have been used to do um, new things. Sometimes they've been used to just get stronger and do the same things. Also, even people learning how to navigate new systems. So another um, of my favorite examples from the grantee portfolio, Sonia, is your grantee that shared with us that they were, um, they heard that one of the biggest challenges was false, um, having a, play, a safe place to stay for young people who were moving into the child welfare system who tested positive for COVID. And there was a time when young people um, in this um, geographic region that they were working in were placed in hospital settings if they transitioned into the child welfare system while they were positive. And instead, um, one of your partners talked with us about how they worked with um, kind of like Airbnb or sort of like a rental housing um, sector, as well as working with the public health um, system. Like how do you use those dollars that came, could be from federal funding and all these sources and they have restrictions to house people in a place that, that's safe and that is comfortable and that is even nice. And how do you staff that? How do you put the ingredients up? And they even went as far as to say, like, how do you recognize that these are young people in a new place and they're just like people and some things might happen in that place. And how do you even build in supports for that? It's using the funding so flexibly in a different way to keep young people who are already maybe feeling scary and not wanna be in a hospital, like already have so many emotions. And I haven't gotten a chance to talk with them since the study, but I wonder, so that's an example where I think about like, if we were to do our, our next part of the study, where are they now when they learn to navigate all these different dollars and use them in a totally different way? They even talked about a couple of different um, places where young people stayed and teaching the owners of those places how to even like navigate public dollars. So I just wonder like, oh, so many partnerships. I bet things are looking differently, even past the amazing things that they did deep in the pandemic. Um, the second one is increasing leadership and influence of grantee organizations. So we know that grantees talked a lot about and other nonprofits did nationally about changing their practices. So I've seen the, that, that practice really in like the what, what is the service they provide? What are needs that they might be meeting that they weren't meeting before? The how, how much in-person versus virtual, how much of different types of engagement in the who. Um, I've seen a lot of programs change like we were serving this population, but we always also wanted to serve 
younger people or older people or parents in addition to students. And now they've started serving those people and have been able to sustain that. So that is a way that they are addressing the root causes and also kind of the systems around all of those services. And then lastly, stronger practices and policies around virtual supports uh, specifically, which we talked a little bit about. So you know, do you, excuse me, want to add in here about what are your thoughts in terms of what's really endured? Both for, maybe you could also speak to both. Um, I know that you have really good sense of the foundation and also you keep up with kind of foundation nationally and internationally. So what's your sense more like at your focus and also big picture of what has endured? Oh, wow, I think what has, that's a really good question. And a couple of reflections, I think some things were just strengthened during the mm. COVID pandemic. Um, and I have already mentioned that one of our focus has always been on how do I, we identify organizations that are really closely linked to those communities and best suited to serve those communities. So something that we've become much more purposeful with is actually setting a target for that. So we've identified currently in our entire portfolio, how much of our portfolio is actually funding organizations that are closer to the community internationally and domestically that are have representation of that community. So that could be either leadership that's representative of the community through lived experience or BIPOC leadership, depending on the community. It is not a perfect definition, but it's a way of holding ourselves accountable and saying our goal is to increase funding to those organizations that we know are best suited to do this type of work. Um, so as an example, we identified an amazing organization in Uganda. It's led by a refugee from uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. And he has been pulling his budget together from different sources because he has not received any large funding from any large donors. And as a result of the investment we've made in that organization over the last year and a half, he's now been able to hire 20 refugees in Uganda that are supporting other refugee communities, not just from the Congo, Congo but also from South Sudan and from other neighboring countries. Um, so that's something that I think was strengthened during the pandemic because we saw how integral our grantees were to responding to the pandemic, like you mentioned, the foster youth example, and that we want to continue to um, emphasize and be very purposeful with moving forward. Um, another lesson learned that we had, and this came through in the report as well, was just how much grantees appreciated how fast the process was that there weren't, you know, a ton of forms to fill out or a ton of back and forth and questions. Um, and um, we're constantly thinking, how do we improve our internal processes to really support grantees, given that there's so many foundations, and in addition to all the foundations that each have their own processes, I have also worked for the U.S. government that has its own processes, local governments have their own processes, mm -hmm. Um, and so it's a lot. So one thing that we've done is we've um, really asked our grantees to, um, so first of all, we don't require any reports for grants under 100,000. And we don't really require much of a detailed application process. It's very short. So we've eliminated that. But for grants that are larger, we've really um, removed kind of a little bit of the I think confusion around what should we put in a report? Let's figure out, let's list every activity that we've done. And instead we've really focused it on three things. You know, what were some significant things that stood out to you over the last year that you'd like to share with us? What were some significant lessons learned and what were some significant challenges? And then the final question is just, what can the foundation do better to support you? And we've limited it. We said, please limit it to 10 pages because we found that grantees of course are very passionate about their work and they also want to show us what they they've done, and they're spending a lot of time reading these long reports. And what we really, first of all, want to know is what can we do better to support you, but also what were some of those lessons learned so we can apply those across our portfolios and figure out whether we see themes and then get grantees together to have a conversation around those. So that's one something that we've uh, worked on improving um, in the last two years. And then finally, we also recognized, particularly when we work with smaller organizations, that one of um, the missed opportunities is 
the ability to really speak in a way that resonates with other donors. And a lot of donors still are asking, what's your impact? Give us the data. And most of these small organizations do not have an evaluation person, do not mm -hmm. have the system to collect this data. So something we just started piloting about a year and a half ago with our Catholic Sisters Initiative, because they tend to work with really small congregations that are so under-resourced. We have a partner, an evaluation partner in East Africa, one in West Africa, and one in North America that really provides unlimited technical monitoring and evaluation support. So our grantees uh, can opt in to that support and really ask them anything from how do I even define this indicator? What tool can I use to collect this data? Or can you help me develop an evaluation scope of work or even conduct an evaluation on this portfolio of grants so that they can have that information to both inform their programming, but also to talk about all the amazing work that they're doing. So those are some of the examples that have, I think, really pushed us to think about our processes even more because of COVID. We always kind of had it in the back of our mind, how can we yeah. streamline some of the work that we're doing? But this, I think, has added kind of that extra push. Did I answer both of your questions? Yes, yes, you did. Thank you. And with your grantees who have access to that evaluation support, did, did they have that access before the pandemic? No. No, so we just literally piloted that for a year and we're just kind of talking. So it was a one-year pilot and we're just coming towards the end of it and talking about what does the next reiteration look like and waiting to hear back from them what has worked um, and thinking through how do we, because I think having the technical support, as we all know, is important. Um, however, sometimes it's the resources to even, you know, develop some sort of a tool to collect this information or learning more about, you um, or having somebody on staff to support with that. So we're also trying to think about what would it look like to build some of that into our grants in addition to providing the technical support. So these are the discussions we're having internally right now as we're thinking about phase two of this. Yeah, and I was asking since we're really focused on the pandemic today and lots of our questions from our audience were about, you know, where are we now with the pandemic recovery? How are we using data differently? Do you think that people are using that resource and that technical support differently because they're they're getting that during the time of even last year during the time of a pandemic? Or would you say that that support you think would look similar regardless of whether it was kind of like during the pandemic time or not? I think, I think that's a good question. I, I don't think I can quite answer that. I would want to hear. We just had a debrief with the evaluation partners that were providing the technical support, and we sent some feedback um, to our grantees, so we're waiting to get that back. Um, I think uh, that's I think that's a good question, and I couldn't quite answer that. What I do know is that back to just the first point I made around really being purposeful and working with organizations that have that knowledge is also how do we embed that knowledge into some of the evaluation work that we do? And so what we've been working, so for all of our uh, different strategy areas or initiatives, we have one or two or three evaluation and research partners. And one of the things we're consistently trying to um, understand is whether the information that we think is useful for giving us guidance on our strategy could also be useful to the communities we're serving, to the grantees we're working with. And one, uh, a few different ways we're doing that. So one is one of our partners has hired two uh, young people who have experienced the foster care system and is uh, training them to be research assistants to kind of provide that insight. And that's for our foster youth initiative. Our initiative that supports um, individuals who experienced homelessness has also hired somebody who has significant experience with that system to provide insight into the type of questions we're asking and to provide some insight into um, the policy work that we are prioritizing. Um, and again, was this strengthened because of COVID? I think even prior to COVID, we ta started talking about it. I think COVID just emphasized the importance of doing it sooner. and also made us realize that a lot of this can be done remotely. So mm -hmm. um, I think that that was kind of a key lesson. I mean, while it's nice to have the partner in East Africa for our East Africa grantees, they're not always traveling to all those locations. And with internet now constantly improving, they've been able to do a lot of that support online. So that's also kind of expanded how we're thinking about, you know, using different resources and so on. Yeah, thank you so much. And I want to ask, our chat has been pretty quiet. 
Um, I want to ask everybody in the chat if you have practices that have endured or what's going well for you. So that could be your grant making processes or your internal processes. It could also be what are the long lasting changes that you're seeing happening in your work or the work of others and partners around you. So if anybody might be so kind as to, to share some chats, you can either drop it in the main chat or you can drop it um, in the Q&A. So what's working for you? What do you see um, has endured? And then I will just add Sonia to what you were saying lastly is what we've also seen is the kind of uptick in what some people call trust-based philanthropy, which is connected to what you shared. And that is really just a fancy way for saying that um, foundations and their partners are working closely together. And there's that trusted relationship where just because the organization is receiving funding from a foundation, that doesn't mean that they have to track everything. It also means that they can be transparent, the grantee or the nonprofit or community-based organization can be transparent about what's going on, which is some of what your grantees shared, like, we could be open if it changed, and we could go back to their program officer and talk about it. So um, we've also seen that in the pandemic, that a lot of that trust-based philanthropy and like the relationship building and data still, we love, I love data too, but not so much the focus of just collecting data for um, like accountability metrics, really for us all to understand and use it. Thank um, you. Thank you, Brandy, yeah. for making that point. And maybe I can just build on that because that's sure. me to just think about. So one, um, so in addition to our partnership work, which um, is focused on systems change, we have an equity fund that's completely um, unrestricted, that's really meant to support organizations who have historically been underfunded. And then we have the humanitarian prize, which is a $2.5 million prize that we um, give every year to an organization that does really incredible work to support communities, either internationally or domestically. And so we've taken that approach. And as part of our more strategic areas, we really, and thank you for highlighting that, our program officers are just such amazing individuals who really take sometimes six to 12 months to really engage with our grantees and really understand what are your needs, what are your visions for success. And some of them are piloting some really creative approaches to also support our grantees, either pilot an intervention, um, do research on an intervention first, or to have a planning grant for six or 12 months so they can engage community members in the design process. So I think that's really important. And I think there's a recognition that that space needs to be created for both us to have those conversations, but most importantly for our grantees to really engage their key stakeholders who also have a deep knowledge of um, the uh, issues we're working on. Yeah, thank you so much. Okay. Uh, so next, we're going to shift to our other questions. So we were answering one side of the coin, the coin, excuse me, which is what has endured, what's still going well. The other side of the coin is really what are the challenges in sustain, sustaining these changes? What has not fared so well, or what is under threat? So one, this one is constantly on my mind is the pandemic era funding is running out or most of it has a, speci a specified end in sight. So in uh, particular, the American Rescue Plan Act or the ARPA funds, um, things are kind of coming down or the, the plans are being worked on for them, but we know that these likely are not gonna be renewable funding sources. Um, so some supports that are in place are either dwindling, have dwindled or will dwindled. One example, my um, team member, Lisa, who works on the study with me, um, we were just talking a few weeks ago about school lunch and breakfast programs, which also fund, which also come under ARPA. And seeing that during the pandemic, there was all these increases in food benefits, also schools, um, there were opportunities to provide free breakfast and lunch. And um, some of that has scaled down. Even in the past year, I think about my own son's school where free, there was under COVID free breakfast and lunch last year, but it's not happening this year. Now it's only free breakfast and lunch is back to, you know, you have to apply. It's not just kind of a blanket policy. And those were um, funding that was coming under ARPA. So we're already seeing, I already see it. And I also know from following the policies that those, um, that funding will be dwindling out. It's great to see what communities have done with that funding and will do because it has um, lots of flexibility and especially for a government source. Um, and then another point there is that there are shortfalls in terms of what happens with some of those supports that we created or will create with ARPA funding, what happens to them? Where will they be absorbed? 
Um, we see that uh, many states and municipalities don't have funding to sustain some of those things, or maybe they would have had them in the first place, even without COVID. And we also see how philanthropy has stepped into those cracks in the past with COVID and many other times. So thinking about what might that look like, but where might the um, kind of the, the backup plans might not already be in place for that. And then lastly, we've seen major disruptions in the workforce in COVID. Um, so we also see shortages, again, thinking of my own experience in my son's childcare center, seeing the shortage in childcare centers, seeing the shortage of um, teachers. I just heard a story last week of someone saying that at school close by to us, a superintendent was being a substitute in a class because of the teacher shortages. So there are major workforce shortages and those things really have upticked um, during COVID. And so thinking about many of what we said in that earlier slide about the wraparound supports that COVID did help to bolster, there are workforce shortages in those who are key and essential to providing those supports. So those are some of the things um, that we flag that we see that are under threat to many of the changes and successes that have come from philanthropy and from COVID funding widespread. So yeah, I'll turn to you and ask you um, the same question. What do you see as um, threats to sustaining some of the changes and bolstering that we've seen in the pandemic? I think those completely uh, resonate with what we're seeing as well. And um, I think our teams are consistently asking themselves, what can what can we do to address this? And the workforce component um, has come up uh, through both um, our um, work with opportunity youth, as well as our work with um, our early childhood um, development uh, team. Um, and um, this is one issue that I know both teams are thinking about, how can they support our partners address some of those workforce issues. Um, I'm also excited that California, I think is the first state to have, I believe it's over 30 um, uh, guaranteed income projects that they're piloting with different groups that need additional support. We have some evidence around what works. Uh, and internationally, we have quite a bit of evidence in terms of cash transfer, particularly in certain settings and how they can lead to uh, really important outcomes. And I'm really excited. So we're funding um, we're funding a partner to look um, across all those 30 different pilots and to pull out what are the key lessons learned. And then we are going to work on a dissemination plan for key policymaker on those. Because I think as we're seeing all of these different challenges, we need to think about a different way of working and what might be needed to address them. So um, those all resonate with us. I think um, the only one that I will add that I know uh, probably all of us after being in a pandemic can identify as, is increased mental challenges. I think both in younger yeah. children, uh, in older mm -hmm. children, in adults, in our partners, um, some of our teams are thinking about how, how do we as a foundation support some of our partners? We have these amazing leaders um, that are just working nonstop. What can we do as a foundation to lift some of that burden? Is it a retreat? Even some small nice to haves because I think that's something that's just so evident across I think all ages, all sectors, and it's constantly on the back of our minds in terms of what we could be doing better to support um, our partners. Yeah, thank you for talking about that. I mean, I think that's also part of the trust-based philanthropy piece too, because um, traditionally we had seen that it's sort of like not only philanthropy, but everybody is like, we're funding the work. And I appreciate that you're calling out that the support of the people who drive that work is also the work as well. Um, and the mental health of those people and the, the people that they serve too. So thank you for those additions. Um, okay, we are going to move. So what do we do? In light of that, um, what are our practices? What do we do moving forward? Actually, I did have one other thing I wanted to ask you on this one. So um, sometimes I hear people talking about every major foundation had a COVID-19 recovery grant making, whether it was small mini grants or millions and billions of dollars. It was such a big thing for philanthropies to really respond to that call to action. So what happens to all of those COVID-19 funds and the new issues that were picked up in that 
that portfolio that might not be for Hilton or for any foundation part of most foundations have sort of a mission or, you know, a set of funding priorities. So what happens when the things that you were funding COVID may either may do or not overlap um, with your existing portfolios? But question one, and if I could just add a part two, one is, do you recall, Sonia, anything that you were not funding previously, but you did in COVID, and then you embedded that back into your funding strategy? Like maybe this was in our area before, but it, um, you know, shapes something that we might want to do differently in the future and might want to embed in how we work or how we fund. Thank you. Those are good questions. I think in terms of your first um, question, um, just in terms of um, what are we doing now, um, we recognize that the experts are our grantees, are the communities we're working with. And our role um, is really to facilitate relationships and to really figure out how do we support them, build relationships with each other and other key stakeholders. So um, our teams are really purposeful, both through their engagement, but also by bringing grantees to get together to create those partnerships to figure out where there's alignment. So I think that will continue. And I think some of those opportunities, like for foster youth that you have lifted, I'm pretty sure our homelessness team is working closely now with that FY team to really think about, are there other creative um options that we can use for helping people who um, are unhoused. Um, I, I cannot think of a specific example because these are existing grantees. Mm -hmm. um, we have been pretty flexible in terms of really thinking through, while we have a strategy, our strategies are quite broad and they allow us to be really nimble and they also allow us to really address if there's a specific need. Um, so I, I, I think most of our teams are continuing the conversations with our grantees. And one um, example of something that's come up, and this was even starting before COVID, part of our foster youth strategy is not prevention. We're primarily focusing on a supporting transition age youth. However, there's a clear need that prevention needs to be part of that discussion. And it was even more clear during the pandemic when there was limited caregivers, when there was all the issues that you had mentioned as well. So the team is now more purposefully talking about what would it look like for us to do some work in prevention? So there's a few examples of new ideas. Um, and again, I think because we continue to work with the same grantees, there's ways that we're going to figure out how to best support them, especially if they pivoted in a certain way and if that pivot really makes sense to continue um, in terms of providing that support to their community. So what do we do? What are our practices? Um, one is consider long-term COVID-19 recovery needs. So like you have mentioned mental health, we've talked about workforce. Um, another major thing is the long-term educational impacts from disruption in education um, and schooling. Um, there are a number of things that have, have long-term impacts. We also know not only from COVID, but um, like me as a disaster researcher, we know that um, large-scale disasters have major long-term effects. Um, even longer than most people think they are. And even when you think the effects have settled out, the way that the inequities exacerbate in the face of the disaster, that that is longstanding in communities, especially for individuals and communities that aren't able to take that hit, take those added stressors, are already dealing with many stressors that are both chronic and acute. So one is think about what are those long-term needs? Two, further strengthen connections and collaborations. Uh, we talked a lot about collaborations today, so I'll leave that one there, but that is long-term forever work. Three, support grantees in institutionalizing best practices. So for instance, some of the examples that we gave, um, I'd be interested to do lots of longer-term recovery studies and thinking about, so what extent did those practices shape that long-term? And this also answers some of the questions that we received from the queue when people signed up. It's like, what are those longer-term metrics? One of the big ones is understanding some of the immediate changes that grantees, nonprofits, philanthropies, partners took, and then understanding how sustainable those changes were, especially the changes that tended to be really helpful for the organizations and the people that they partner with and support. Last is continue to build organizational capacity. So there's growing literature about operational supports and unrestricted funding. 
Sonia, you and I have had these conversations as partners in work and like the importance of that and also the fact that it doesn't always look the same. So some foundations or some partners might say, we don't do unrestricted funding. Some might say, we only do unrestricted funding. We only support the capacity. So there's really this large band, but I would say what we could all kind of coalesce around is that organizations need capacity to drive their work. And that is people power, that is um, technology, that's resources, that's physical space, Places to be in, that's mental health supports for um, supporting the people who work in them well so that they can support others. So really growing organizational capacity. Um, and then lastly, before we wrap up and we have a couple of questions in our queue, we'll talk about kind of evaluation a little bit more. But before that, anything else to add for this one for you, Sonia? I think that's a, a really good point. And um, especially the last point, I think organizations do have a lot of needs. And I think um, we've come a long way in terms of us trying to identify what those needs are. And um, I am seeing us be much more thoughtful with really thinking about if you're implementing this program uh, that is supporting an additional 5,000 uh, children, what do you need as an organization to do that well? And then really being thoughtful and building that into the grant so that they can have the project management support, they can have yep. the evaluation support. We've actually developed more detailed budget guidance to really encourage our partners to budget for everything. We found that not everyone is familiar with how an indirect works, especially small organizations, and really mapping out everything that they could budget for. We found that it really leads to richer conversations. Oh, can I actually ask budget for some time from this advisor that gives us, yes, you can. And so um, that's a really, I think, important point. And also an important point for us to recognize that we don't always know what that is. And having those conversations is a way we're going to figure that out and figure out what's the best way to support them in achieving um, those um, goals. Yeah, and that also reminds me of kind of like a bigger picture lesson learned from disaster recovery about organizations and their budget capacity. And sometimes because of... Um, uh, disasters leading to the output of resources. Organizations can be receiving more funding than they are used to. Um, and not not in your case, because you had a longstanding relationship with your partners, but I've seen even government evaluations that I've done post-disasters. I've seen government departments who applied for funding from disaster declarations and literally received more money in one year than they've moved in past years all put together. So building up an organization to receive funding and be able to to kind of get that money out is a whole process that sometimes we don't even think about. And younger, newer, smaller organizations also need that support and may not be as robust as the larger scale ones that are used to kind of turning that funding and have the internal staffing capacity to do it. So lastly, I want to point us to if you, our whole question was about um, COVID-19 recovery and like, what can you learn? And we know that some partners haven't had a chance to evaluate their COVID-19 efforts. They have funded, they have done, they have supported and life has gotten crazy and haven't gotten a chance to really see um, what does the data look like around things that we either funded or we supported? So just to me a reminder, if you haven't done that already, even though we are three years since the onset, you may have distributed funding a long time ago. You may have also recently distributed funding and been doing COVID efforts because we are still in a pandemic. There are still impacts of the pandemic. Um, so here are some things that you might want to think about if you are evaluating. One is that um, think about the impact of your COVID funds. So how were those funds used? Think about collaboration and partnerships, which we talked about. Also think about organizational capacity, as well as policy and system change and effort. So these are kind of four buckets where people have asked, like, what do we look at? What are the metrics? What do we want to know about? This is, these are some of the buckets that we focus on in the Hilton COVID grant making funding. And we've also done other um, COVID-19 and other disaster recovery studies. And these are some of the key buckets. So if you're thinking about metrics, this might be a place to start. And a couple of questions we have in our chat. Um, we have a couple of comments. One is that glad to hear the focus on mental health and R&R, &R, rest and recovery for support partners. 
Um, another comment, we found many small organizations did not have a cash flow to wait for federal reimbursement. That is very true. We also saw that in this study that um, by having some of the first funds that will that were put out even before government funding, some of the nonprofit or community-based funders were actually helping with that cash flow issue, either by putting in money or putting in money that could be recovered or reimbursed for later. And then there was one more, <laughs> excuse me, question about um, the rules for um, COVID-19 kept changing. How did you stay ahead and not overstep any policies or kind of restrictions? And so yeah, I'll let you take that up there. I would say that one thing about philanthropy is that it doesn't have as many kind of adherence to some of those rules and policy changes that were happening as much as federal or other sources. So that's why um, philanthropy is able to fill in the cracks of some of the places that we talked about today. So yeah, anything you want to add there? I would just say that to kind of stay ahead, we we didn't get as much involved in the policy discussions around COVID, both domestically and internationally. We deferred to our partners to really come to us and say, this is what we can do within this policy environment. This is what makes sense now in terms of messaging versus what. So we we did not lean in on that, but rather defer to our partners. Yeah, thank you for answering. And then there's a question about, will we get a recording and the slide? Yes, we will be sharing materials and following up. Um, you also have our kind of email from signing up for this webinar and, and we have an interest page on our website. So if you would like to reach out to myself or reach out to Sonia, learn more about how to evaluate your impacts or learn more about the COVID-19 recovery um, kind of impacts and implications, we're glad to have further conversation. I'll do a final call in our last couple of minutes for any other questions. I'll just do a quick 10 minute pause for anything else anyone wants to drop in the chat. And maybe while I do that, Sonia, do you have any closing words you'd like to share? First, thank you, Brandy, and to your team for uh, doing this evaluation and for enabling us to have this learning. I think um, just, um, my reflection has been um, as we continue to um, work with our partners and really think about the information we collect from them and how we use that information, just the importance of being really thoughtful and purposeful, um, mm -hmm. especially during COVID. We all know that people were working two or three different jobs, however you want to define those jobs. Mm -hmm. And it was really important for us not to add any additional burden with our processes. And I keep reflecting of how important that is to continue to do and to really, as we uh, both develop internal processes, but also as we work with our evaluation partners, really thinking about what information do we actually need to make decisions? How is that information aligned with the community's need to make decisions and to our partners need to make decisions? And I don't think this sh should stop during a pandemic. I think these should be questions that we continue to ask ourselves. Um, so that's kind of what stayed with me and that as we continue with our evaluation practice, I keep asking myself as we um, move forward uh, with our work. Yeah, thank you so much, Sonia, for sharing and having that final word. Um, a thank you to everyone who's joined us today. I hope there are some things, some useful tidbits that you can take away and also lots of thanks to the Hilton team and the grantees for so openly sharing with us and to the community science team for the work on the study in this webinar. Thanks so much and we hope to hear back from you all. Take care.